welcome to uh, this session, which ties into chapter three of your textbook from Boss. And in this session, we're going to be talking about language in communication, which is really important to the critical thinking process. And uh, there's a lot to think about when we look at language in communication. As you look at this uh, couple or these two people sitting on the bench, how are they communicating to each other? Maybe you want to take just a few moments to jot down on a piece of paper. There's at least three, potentially four or more ways that they're actually communicating and communicating to each other. I want to talk to you about the process of communication. This is Bell's model of communication. You won't find it in your textbook, but I wanted to put it in just to alert you to how the communication process functions. And so in communication, normally we'll have a transmitter, someone who wants to send a message. Of course, we know that today that message can be sent verbally. It can be sent non-verbally. It can be sent via email, via text. Uh, there's many ways today that we can send messages. So we have a transmitter, someone who wants to send a message. We then also have what we call the receiver, someone who, or a party of people that are receiving the message that is being transmitted, being sent. And that's all well and good as we think about the message that's being sent. The only problem is that so often in communication, what we find is this small problem of what we call semantic interference. And so often the message that's being sent is not the message then that is being heard by the recipient because we get this interference along the way, an interference of meaning. And sometimes that interference is impeded uh, or is, is engendered by uh, culture. Sometimes it's engendered by a lack of understanding of the words. Sometimes a person's education, all kinds of factors can impede the communication process. And so we need to be aware of that as we embark on a critical thinking strategy. So here are some of the factors then that impact uh, the communication process. One is gender. How uh, different, gen uh, how genders communicate, male and female, or man and woman, sometimes differs in the approach to uh, their communication. Ethnicity, uh, culture. We can have the same language but different meaning. This is something that I learned when I came to Canada. I, uh, thought I would put uh, the groceries in the boot, only to find that the boot was actually the trunk. Well, in Africa, you certainly don't want to put the groceries in the trunk because that belongs to a three-ton elephant. And so there are all those things. We call the horn the hooter. Well, apparently, it's not very polite in Canada to say that I hit the hooter. It's much better to say I honked the horn. And so culture can impact uh, the communication process. So the transmitter, the receiver, but then along the way, you have the semantic interference that is uh, uh, engendered by some of these factors. And then, of course, dress. How we dress sometimes can also impact the communication process. We might say things by the way we dress without even intending to. And then the issue of jargon. One time I was teaching a class and I said, liminality leads to communitas, which leads to emergence. And I realized that I had to back up and explain each of those terms because I understood them but uh, that's because I worked in those domains, but the class didn't. So there are many ways that language uh, and communication can be impeded. Uh, language, though, enables effective critical thinking. And so once we're aware of the communication process and how that is impacted by semantic interference, by these different factors, we then are able to come and understand that language enables effective critical thinking. We need to use language effectively to convey information. We need to learn how to use language effectively to convey information. One of the things I would urge you as students to do is to make use of the Writing Center and the Student Learning Center. Students who use the Writing Center and the Student Learning Center for their assignments in my course graded significantly higher than those who chose not to use the Writing Center. And it's essential to communicate well to uh, our individual and collaborative critical thinking. It is also important to understand that while language greatly en enriches our communications of ideas and feelings, it also can contribute to ambiguity and misunderstanding. In fact, wars have been started because people misunderstood terms and people have uh, embarked on family feuds and fights and all kinds of uh, bad outcomes simply because of a misunderstanding uh, in language. And so we need to use language effectively to convey information, to provide direction, 
and to express our feelings. And of course, we've spoken earlier about the link of emotion and reason in critical thinking. We need to be able to express those feelings and uh, be able to understand other people's feelings in the critical thinking process. It's also important to understand that while language greatly enriches our communication of ideas and feelings, it truly can lead to misunderstanding, as we've said. And intellectual curiosity and awareness of other people's language use are two critical thinking skills that can make us less susceptible to misunderstanding and manipulation. One of the great examples I have of this is in my home country, South Africa, where I noticed that a lot of uh, people, as a, as a term of endear uh, endearment or uh, an expression of, uh, of uh, respect, would call someone chief. And so as I was working in the bank, uh, the, the gentleman who made the tea came and, and uh, we had people who made tea and brought tea to our desk. Uh, I thanked him and I said, well, thank you so much for the tea, chief. And he said, don't call me chief. And so I realized then that, uh, you know, what I thought was a good term was actually not a good term. And so we need to have this intellectual curiosity that enables us to ask and to understand and to listen. This term may seem to us a good term, but is it actually, are we understanding that person's language? When I was in Jamaica, I tried to learn Patwa. And uh, I had a Patwa book, and I was, and I was learning uh, Miss, uh, Miss Hungry Me Trapanut, and you know, all of these expressions. And I walked through to our host, and I had this expression that I learned, and I said it out loud to her. And, my, and she started laughing, and my wife started uh, giggling. And she said, don't ever say that to a woman. So one has to know uh, what the terms mean and how they impact uh, the person that we're speaking to. So effective communication involves several related skills. Number one, we need to keep the avenues of communication open. This often happens between a couple where they'll be angry with each other and they just won't talk to each other for days on end. This can happen in a business setting where people avoid each other. This can happen where there's misunderstanding and people shut down. We need to, if we're going to embark on a critical thinking process and begin to understand and engage, we need to make sure that we keep the avenues of communication open. We need to communicate with others clearly and accurately. We need to work hard to be clear in our communication. We need to work hard to be accurate in our communication. One of the things I always make sure I do is that I uh, check emails and sometimes I even put them in the drafts folder so I can go back and check on them. Uh, language is a system of communication with arbitrary symbols, whether spoken, written, or nonverbal. We need to understand that. And by creating a shared reality among pe people, language is the primary means of uh, transmitting cultural concepts and traditions. If you want to understand a person's culture, understand their language. And for me, I, I learned Zulu because I wanted to understand the Zulu culture. Uh, I learned Afrikaans because I wanted to understand the Afrikaans culture. And those shed a huge light for me on those cultures. And I was able to engage with those people and understand them far more readily and their style of communication. When you think about that, you need to know that the world comprises many different languages. We think that English is becoming the lingua franca of the world. And in one sense it is. It is becoming uh, the vernacular. But there are still many different languages. And those languages imbibe and embody the culture of those peoples. And so as we communicate, as we embark on critical thinking, we need to realize that. Language has one basic function, and, that, and it is the communication of information about ourselves and the world. Other fa functions of language include directive language, influencing people, expressive language, e communicating our feelings, and ceremonial language. That is used in formal circumstances, such as a wedding or parliament, we use formal language. Legal language, which is sometimes very hard to understand, that's what we call ceremonial or formal language. Most languages serve multiple functions. Not all language, as we know, is nonverbal. What do you think this person is expressing? Nonverbal cues, such as body language and vocal tone, often help us interpret verbal communication. Really important to listen to what a person is saying, but also to listen to how they're saying it. And that can occur in emails, that can occur in text. LOL has become such a great way to end a text just to make sure people know that you're not, uh, you're not being directive, but you're, you're open in, in your communication. Uh, and images such as artwork or photographs are also a means of communicating uh, ideas and feelings. 
We need to understand that language is a cultural con construct. As I've mentioned, good critical thinkers realize that word choices and nonverbal cues significantly influence how verbal communication is interpreted or misinterpreted. In, in my country, the Zulu people, to show respect, do not look you in, in the eye when they're communicating with you. They simply look down and often they'll clasp their hands. To us, that would be a sign of disrespect. And so we need to understand the nonverbal cues uh, in critical thinking because that helps us then engage in the critical thinking process. There are assertive communicators, there are aggressive communicators, there are passive communicators, and there are passive aggressive communicators, which are sometimes the worst because they may be smiling, but uh, actually they're undermining in their process of communication. And sometimes we need to be able to discern and detect that and work through that. People also use language to manipulate. And they do that through euphemism, dysphemism, sarcasm, and hyperbole. And you can look those all up in your textbook. They're in there. Deception and lying. To know when a person is lying. To understand and to look at the nonverbal cues that help us to detect lies. That's very important as critical thinkers. What do you think these facial expressions are saying by these two ladies? Language is a form of symbolic communication that allows us to organize, to express, and to critically analyze our experiences. It shapes our understanding of reality and of ourselves. Good communication skills are vital in critical thinking. Thank you.